The Earmax Center is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts six presentations per semester. For the fall 2009 semester, the presenters belong to the faculties of Applied Sciences, Arts and Social Sciences, Business Administration, and the Faculty of Education. Today's speaker is Dr. Arthur Robson, Canada Research Chair in Economic Theory and Evolution, Department of Economics. to invite Professor uh, Myers to introduce our speakers today. Uh, thank you. So I just, I'll just say a few things about Arthur. Arthur is one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, and so I could say a lot, but I'll try and keep it short. So Arthur uh, came uh, out of New Zealand as a young lad to uh, MIT to start a PhD in pure math. Uh, he found that too easy, so he switched to economics partway through. I'm just kidding about he found, found it too easy. Uh, he got himself a Nobel laureate for a senior supervisor at uh, MIT, graduated, went to University of Western Ontario for a big chunk of his career. Um, which uh, might sound a little bit strange, but uh, UWO had the best economics department in Canada and one of the uh, one of a, a top department in the world for a good decade. Um, he came to us seven years ago as our CRC uh, chair in economic theory and evolution. Uh, in terms of honors and awards, he has lots. For example, he had a Killam Fellowship towards the end of his time at UWO. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society, which might require a little bit of explanation. Econometric Society is a very exclusive club in economics. Uh, there's about 500 fellows worldwide, uh, 10 in Canada. Um, about five or over 5% of them are Nobel laureates. Uh, so it's a big deal in economics. Um, you know, these are sort of the, uh, the you know, adornments maybe of his career. Um, but, you know, there's also his scholarship. So uh, the, the substance, I would say, is, uh, of his scholarship is much bigger than the adornments. Uh, Arthur is the seminal founder of a new literature in economics, a seminal slash founder, uh, on the biological basis of uh, economic behavior. Uh, it would take too long to explain why I feel this way, but my personal opinion is that um, this area, this new literature in economics is going to have a really, honest to God, profound effect on the way people do uh, economics. It's going to change where we start and allow us to do things that will, uh, will uh, un allow us to better understand the way people behave and in the economic sphere and will allow us to do a better job of trying to make a contribution. And Arthur, uh, you know, jumped into this 20 years ago, and now many people are jumping in, many big shots, and so it's off to the races. And I'm just very proud to have Arthur in the economics department. Thank you. Well, oh, well, oh, shucks. Uh, <coughs> So the particular focus of the first paper uh, that I want to uh, outline today uh, can be introduced with reference to the oeuvre of an obscure uh, Canadian folk group. Uh, when I used that line uh, on audiences in the United States, they've been unkind enough to point out that uh, adding the adjective obscure to Canadian folk group is redundant. Uh, this group is the McGarrigals of Montreal, uh, and they have a, a plaintive ditty, Why Must We Die? And this is the question I want to uh, entertain ourselves with uh, today. Why must we age to be uh, a little bit more precise about it, or to be even more precise uh, why does mortality rise in the latter stages of life? 
I have a co-author who's an anthropologist on this uh, paper, uh, Hilly Kaplan, who's uh, devoted um, a lot of his career to studying modern hunter-gatherers. And the philosophy there is that studying them will uh, lay bare the demographic essence uh, that we share, but where our demography has perhaps been, been muddied rather by uh, modern medicine in particular. <clears throat> so he studied the Arche of um, Bolivia, who uh, were, hunt were hunter gatherers into the 20th century, uh, and he's currently studying uh, the Chimane uh, uh, of another landlocked South American country. Uh, Bolivia. These are not pristine hunter-gatherers because they have limited forms of agriculture, but they're uh, as close as you're going to get in, uh, in the modern world when hunter-gatherers, the supply of hunter-gatherers societies is running out. So let's look at the, the, their um, the mortality rates for hunter-gatherers. This is for all of the uh, hunter-gatherers for whom the data exist. So we're talking some thousands of people, not very many. And plotted there is the log of hazard rate. The, the dark uh, line at the top is chimpanzees. You don't want to be a chimpanzee. High mortality, unambiguously higher. And various hunter-gatherer groups um, with different colors plotted at the bottom. So why must we die? Why do we get old? Uh, translates more precisely into the question, why is this, this onrushing wall of death on the right-hand side of the multicolored uh, bunch of lines, starting perhaps at age 40, but getting really going at age 50 and 60? Why does it go up? I mean, there's no surprise that we die, that be that there'd be positive mortality. There'd be there are accidents, there are diseases that um, are boiling away in the back, simmering away in the background uh, for anyone. But why does it get worse as we get old? Is the question. It seems such a uh, wasteful strategy by Mother Nature to take a uh, an adult human being. Uh, a going concern, producing uh, stuff, producing offspring, uh, and trash this individual in favor of starting over again. So speaking of um, starting over again, let's look at the data for um, that one, fertility, yes. So here we have uh, starting over again. And the question is, uh, so you can see uh, there's a, a, a graph, the red line representing fertility, female fertility amongst the, uh, the hunter-gatherers. It's, 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 there's a hump shape. They get off to a flying start at age 12 or thereabouts. Uh, and uh, maximal uh, fertility is around age 25, approximately. And at age 52 or thereabouts, uh, fertility is again zero. So you can ask some subsidiary questions there that are of particular relevance to us uh, human beings. Um, why is it zero at first? Why is it, uh, more particularly, why is it zero at the end of life? If you look at the, um, the, the red dotted line, <coughs> which represents life expectancy, uh, for a 52-year-old female, uh, she has a life expectancy of around still a remaining life expectancy conditional on being 52 of around 18 years. So the question is, why so much? If, it's kind of turning the first question around, but if uh, fertility has ceased, what's the point of uh, having this individual stick around from a biological point of view? So we're going to... Um, So when you, when you think about the growth that's occurring, 
growth. Here we have the weight line. So I've given you a, given away all the secrets here. You can remember all those. When you think about when you think about growth, which I mentioned before, uh, it sharpens a mystery about why uh, we grow old. I mean, we take an adult human being and we trash them. We start it all over again. You can see you can see uh, how much investment is needed in the sheer physical size of somebody on the white line. Starting very low, uh, growing, uh, a, a, a determinate growth pattern, so-called in biology. We have a program that tells us to grow for uh, 18, 20 years and then stop. And you can see the evidence of it there. We use this growth as, as an additional factor why uh, mortality would go down at the beginning, beginning of life. And when there was this onrushing wall of uh, mortality that's facing us all. And I look around the room. We've all successfully navigated the wall at the left-hand side of the picture, but it's just as intellectually remarkable that that exists. We're using growth uh, as, a, as, a, as a factor to explain that. <coughs> So we're going to develop, we develop in this paper an integrated model that uh, explains and relates all the key demographic phenomena that we're subject to, that we've uh, looked at quickly on those slides. It's a model that uh, features somatic capital, somatic just being a biological word meaning bodily and capital meaning capital as in economics, as, as in an investment. This, this capital we th think of as having two key attributes. It, there's its quantity, which is the number of cells. Very simple, concrete interpretation. Uh, and we're going to think of investment in that as being possible. Investment in that as being irreversible. You won't shrink. If you looked at the white line for the weight of these hunter-gatherers, they do seem to shrink a little. If you looked at our graphs, We'd, send to, we'd seem to grow a little bit, we're just getting fat. We're also going to think of uh, capital as having another key attribute, which is its quality. And this has to do with the efficiency with which cells operate. So the evidence that there, that there is a decrease in, in, in efficiency is uh, on the next slide, that one. So this is something that's, uh, you know, all of these graphs for these hunter-gatherers, although in principle they're, they're, they're representing a clean version, uh, cleaned up, uh, clean, where you clean out the effect of modern medicine, it's remarkable how similar they look to uh, graphs for uh, modern societies such as our own. And, of course, you'd see this kind of thing in, among us also. So on the, on the vertical axis, Hilly has uh, invented some uh, measure of aerobic efficiency of his, of his own. Uh, joules per heartbeat wouldn't matter if you put VO2 max uh, on the vertical axis. There's something, uh, if you measure how, how much physical work an individual can do, it's going to go up as you have growth occurring and a bit longer. But inevitably, sadly, it's going to decrease. And it's going to decrease, even though the physical size of the individual is not decreasing. The physical size of the individual is roughly uh, what it was since age 20 or thereabouts. And this we want to attribute to a decrease in quality of the cells. We want to allow for this model to be a model of why we age that's worthy of the name. It should be, it should be the case that we're not... Uh, saying that cells deteriorate exogenously uh, in terms of their quality over time because it would be just to replace w one mystery by one that's almost as great. Why do they get worse over time? So in the model, we want to allow uh, for the possibility of offsetting the decrease in quality that occurs or even reversing it. The kind of... Um, There we go. Press it once very carefully, quickly. So the kind of story that biologists are fond of with respect to uh, aging uh, 
is summarized on that slide. So as a result of metabolic processes, uh, the mitochondria in the cell uh, produce garbage byproducts of this process. This, some of this garbage takes the form of reactive oxygen species, which are little pesky molecules featuring oxygen, as you might imagine, in a central role that uh, wander about and can cause damage. Can cause, here, here's a, uh, an example of ROSs causing damage to the uh, mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA of a neighboring neuron, this all being uh, a sea of neurons. This, this, this sort of damage, if you talk about neurons, leads to uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, or is implicated in Lou Gehrig's disease, and in Alzheimer's. So also what's, what's important here is that uh, it's, uh, some, some observations, some data concerning uh, perhaps biologist's second favorite experimental animal, which is a tiny little worm called C. elegans. Uh, second favorite, I guess, to Drosophila. And the relevant, the relevant uh, uh, observation concerning C. elegans is that if you look at a population of C. elegans, there's a type in there that uh, extends its life by a factor of five or so. And this type is not most, the most common type, but the existence of this type proves that that's possible. I, we're not talking about uh, Methuselah C. elegans. We're talking about critters that live a few weeks at the best of times, so multiplying, so not the best times, but usually, and they can multiply this by a factor of five and maybe live a couple of months. And what the, what seems to be going on with uh, one thing that's going on, so there's a well-oiled genetic me mechanism for extending the lifespan of C. elegans. And the question is, if it's so hot to extend the lifespan of C. elegans, why aren't they all doing it? One thing that seems to happen is that uh, <coughs> this genetic variant uh, involves producing uh, large molecules that can attach themselves to the pesky ROS molecules so that the whole mess can somehow be flushed from the cell. And that's what's going on in that slide. There's some, it's, it's uh, somehow able to process the, these ROS oxygen, ROS molecules in a way that makes them uh, innocuous. So it has to be expensive. This molecule is kind of large. And it has to be expensive. Uh, there aren't direct measures of that, but it seems to be seems to be that it would have to be expensive to um, uh, manufacture this molecule. And so the issue seems to be one of cost. Well, it might be expensive to do this, but we need to have an alternative. We need to understand what the alternative is. And for the alternative, we want to appeal to a uh, or develop, embellish a, a theory of a, of a biologist named Thomas Kirkwood. Uh, his theory is uh, the theory of the disposable soma. This, this uh, theory relies on the observation uh, or the central dogma of bio molecular biology under a little bit of attack recently. But the, the central dogma is that there is a separation of the uh, germline and the soma. So if you take uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's pumped iron furiously for most of his adult life, and you had been covered with baby oil on numerous, numerous occasions, uh, maybe we could chop his arm off. And now let's look at his kids with Maria. They will, they will show no signs of this. They won't be muscular. They may have inherited some gene that's relevant for, to becoming muscular, it's possible. But they're not going to be muscular without working out. They'll have both their arms. They won't be covered in baby oil. They won't have a slight Austrian accent. 
There's a separation, that is, of his, uh, of his soma, his body, and his uh, germline, which is his, his, his sex cells. So it's important to us in the version of this theory that we want to push that there is uh, presumably a lot more of you, a lot more of your soma than there is of your uh, sex cells. So imagine, imagine a technology that uh, can stave off the deterioration of any cell, soma or germline. Uh, and imagine that the cost of doing this it seems almost inescapable that the cost of doing this will increase as you increase the number of cells at issue. Then it's going to be much cheaper to maintain the uh, quality of your sex cells, of your germline, and then it would be to maintain the quality of you, the rest of you. And so that's the basis of the theory that uh, it's going to, in fact, pay uh, to do that. It's going to pay to, ma to stick to maintaining the quality of the, of the germline and let the quality of the soma go to hell in the handbasket. So the aspect of the model that's most economic getting the hang of this, uh, is concerns intergenerational transfers, which are huge for human beings. They're huge in hunter-gatherer societies. They're huge for us. It's another, uh, another observation, set of observations that uh, qualitatively look very similar for hunter-gatherers to modern societies. So here's a uh, picture of some intergenerational transfer among the Ache. Uh, the kid is uh, looking in the bowl. This, these are post-contact uh, pictures witnessed by the uh, existence of the metal bowls. Um, but there's, there's, there's the, the, in an obvious way, the parents are looking after the kid. If you graph Uh, data for hunter-gatherers, again, all the, all the data that's available, which isn't a huge amount. Uh, you, can get, you can build up a picture for uh, human life history uh, in, in terms of economics, in terms of these transfers. So just focus on the dark line, the, the, the most uh, obvious of those lines. Uh, what we're doing there is we're taking a six-month-old infant uh, in the middle of the first year, that is, we're, we're figuring out the probability that infant is still with us. Uh, it's quite a lot less. It's less than one, although it's still a lot of mortality in there, uh, although it's still pretty close to one, I guess. Multiply that by the uh, flow deficit of calories, food. They presumably, they're not doing anything productive, uh, and they're eating some, maybe not a lot, but they're, they're running out of deficit. And then we're going to do that again for the middle of the second year, 18 months, take the probability that, that kid is still with us, uh, multiply it by the flow deficit, and add it to the first number. So we're accumulating a, 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 a debt. In the same way as uh, the government debt is accumulation of past deficits, uh, we're doing the same kind of arithmetic here. So things look worse and worse as you... Uh, you get a bit bigger, you become a teenager, you start being a bit productive, but on the other hand, you're, probably, you're eating a lot more too. Finally, at around age 18 or thereabouts, uh, humans start to produce about as much as they consume, and after, thereafter, there's a, there's a surplus, and so we're starting to climb back out of this hole. And an interesting issue uh, intuitively and meaningful theoretically is when do you get back to zero? When is it that you finally have paid off all your debts? It's, it, it's around age 50. Maybe it's a little short of age 50, 
but it's pretty, pretty old. Uh, and uh, humans have to live a long time for this strategy to work. They have to be 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds even, though they say that with pride being one. They're important in terms of generating some jam, some gravy at the end of uh, this picture. You can see that it ends on, it goes up, ends at, uh, ends, well, is, is above zero. It tails off a bit at the end, and that's just saying that there's a very limited form of old age uh, pensions among hunter-gatherers that, that for a brief period you're allowed to, again, to uh, consume more than you produce. Not, it's not too extensive, and there are horrifying stories, uh, but there is a little bit of that. So, a huge, so, so the, the, similar, the similar line for chimpanzees is the line at the top. It's the same kind of, uh, the thin line at the top. It's the same kind of, uh, qualitatively the same picture, numerically a pale shadow of what you're seeing for humans. It's just mother's milk, in fact, for chimpanzees. There's no other provisioning of uh, young chimpanzees by uh, their parents or anybody else. So that's why you'd expect um, pe people to live for a long time. That's why, in particular, it would make sense for women to live beyond uh, the point where fertility is zero. They have a narrow economic value. They're creating stuff. They're giving it to their kids. That narrow economic value will translate into a generalized biological value uh, in the model. There would be a point in extending uh, human lifespans beyond the end of fertility. So the model does, the model, um, just to go back to some slide slips. Uh -oh. ha. Two slides we've seen before in some order. Sorry about that. Uh, it does, the model does okay. It's a pretty simple model. What is it? It, pre it predicts these shapes for these curves. Um, it predicts that uh, the maximum of fertility should be at the age at which growth ceases, which it's not exactly. Well, it's, it's close. It's as good as it's, it's, it's uh, the age at which growth ceases is perhaps, well, it's age 18 if you're talking about height, but there's some forms of growth that continue after that into the early 20s. Maximum fertility looks like it might be early 20s, 25, something like that. There may be social pressures among the hunter-gatherers that delay fertility. There certainly are among us. Uh, you wouldn't expect that graph to look quite like that for us. It would be shifted to the right, for sure. And uh, so it predicts that. It predicts, the, uh, it predicts that there'll be a zero, that it'll be zero at the end for, for the reason that we were just talking about. It makes perfect sense that that would be. Uh, for mortality, it predicts its U-shape, and it predicts that the minimum point should be to the left of the point at which growth ceases, to the left of age 18 or 20. It's hard to tell from those graphs, but the minimum point, uh, well, certainly in modern data, if you look at the minimum point for mortality, it's around age 10 or 9, even. Uh, and uh, even in those data, it's, it's, it's that age. It's not very dramatic. Uh, it's pretty flat for a long time. So the model does OK for a very simple model. It, it um, does, does encouragingly uh, well. OK. So we've talked about why we die. And let's think about how this makes us impatient. Oh, the wrong way again. Here we go. So, why, so when we're talking about impatience in economics, we're talking about why do we discount future rewards? And why is it that I would rather have other things equal? Why is it the case that I'd rather have $100 now than $100 next year? There's, even when you think about all the other things that, you might, that might bear on that, there's still 
presumed to be a intrinsic pure rate of time preference. And that's what we want to get at. Where does that pure rate of time preference come from? Where does that systematic bias in favor of the future come from? So let's think about uh, a simple critter. This is in some sort of math program. So I guess I'm allowed to have a little math. There's certainly lots of math and economics. Uh, there was a lot of math in the last paper, even though uh, I didn't put much of it up. So let's think about a, 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 a critter uh, a, a, with a pretty simple life history. Uh, I should say, this is a, there's going to be no sex. Uh, I'm too shy to talk about sex. Even more to the point, putting sex in the model is like uh, putting sex in the conversation. Uh, that is, once you put sex in the conversation, the conversation is going to be about nothing else. Once you put sex in the model, uh, there's not going to be room to talk about anything else. So it's not that sex isn't important and wouldn't be nice to put it in the model. There's no room. So, so th these, these, this critter is uh, what biologists call pathogenetic, virgin, virgin birth, virtually. So all of the individuals are she's. This is not just for political correctness. This is for biological plausibility. So the, I suppose that there's a constant death rate. They're being whittled away in continuous time at rate delta. And it, it, they have uh, age, at age t, fertility is xt. And uh, they live from, uh, they, have it, uh, they start at age 0, they live to age l, and at age l we kill them all. Just for mathematical convenience, really. Sorry about that. You make uh, L 122, if you like, which is the uh, modern Olympic record for a longevity set by Jean-Marie Caimont of France not so long ago. Pretty impressive. That's to say, it doesn't have to be a constraint. It doesn't have to be that, uh, that's it, that L is, in, in any sense, a binding constraint. Uh, then we're looking for, the, we're interested in how fast does this population grow? This is a story about biological success. This is a story about uh, uh, success according to Charles Darwin, where victory belongs to the big battalions, not because there's any military structure involved in the battalion, we're just counting. It's the bigness that's the issue. So the, so the growth factor we're looking for, let's call it something, lambda, and it solves this equation. Uh, oil, famed, famed in song and story amongst the demographers, uh, the euler lotka equation. What's um, interesting, so it does settle down, I should say, in, into steady state growth, where there's a constant fraction of the population in each age class, and the steady state growth rate is the solution to that equation. It's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, it also looks like some kind of, from, to an economist, a calculation of an internal rate of return. So what are the, uh, what are the, low, what, are the, what, are the what are the sets of X1 through XL that give you the same success, the, the same growth factor lambda? Well, if we fix the growth factor lambda, that's a pretty simple set. It's just some kind of linear. It's a, it's, a, it's a hyperplane. So the, um, there's a couple of them. They look like that. If we think about moving from one hyperplane to the next, as we move to a better hyperplane, uh, with a higher lambda, that is, the, uh, all the, 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 uh, these, these coefficients aren't constant. Uh, they, they, we're, we're dividing by a, a, a lambda times the e to the delta on the bottom of all of those things, and, with, and, and higher and higher powers as we move up in the age classes. And what's happening is that lambda goes up. All of these hyperplanes tilt in a way that uh, expresses impatience. That is, what it's saying is that as you, if you have po positive population, positive growth, that is, if lambda is greater than 1, then you would rather, if you offered the option of moving one offspring from an older age to a younger age, You'd certainly take it. Any mutant that came up 
that could do that would be smiled upon by evolution. So this translates into a, a, a constant rate of um, time preference or intrinsic uh, rate of time preference. Just translating it in terms of this, this equation, well, the Lutker equation into economic terms, we're imagining that, that CT is the consumption that you have of stuff at age T, and it gives rise to XT via a increasing concave function FT. Doesn't really matter what these, the details here are. This is just the euler lutker equation then, again. And what this is saying is that this, this term on the bottom, this factor on the bottom functions, uh, is playing the role of a pure rate of time preference. If it's, it's the factor that's involved is e to the delta lambda. Or if we took logs of that to convert it to an equivalent continuous time rate, uh, we get delta plus log of lambda, which is saying that you're impatient because you might die. That's obvious that you'd be impatient because you might die. If I offered you $100 this year and told you you had 50% probability of making it till next year, or you, or you had the option, that is, of uh, having it uh, uh, next year, you're obviously going to tend to go for this year. That's, that's all that's saying. But the, the less obvious factor that's arising is the uh, contribution to the growth rate of population, which is log lambda. The So this, this, this is saying that uh, we have the biology just predicts something about the pure rate of time preference. Unfortunately, on the face of it, what if it's sticking its neck out rather in terms of the numbers, because we know what the growth rate of population must have been, at least on average. If we started with Adam and Eve 1.8 million years ago, and we asked what growth, growth rate is it that converted those guys 1.8 million years ago into us, billions of us now, it's zero. It's not exactly zero, but it's extremely close. So this is, this is actually predicting that there shouldn't be much of an additional contribution, although in principle, this would give you a uh, higher intrinsic rate of time preference. It doesn't, when you think about the numbers, mean very much. That is, it, the estimates of the pure rate of time preference in economics are, in fact, sadly lacking. It's something economists should do more work on. But they tend to be higher than a few percent. We have a few percent mortality, and these, the, the estimates that we have for uh, pure rate of time preference are rather higher. It's a bit vague what they are, but they seem to, in general, come in a bit higher. So the last thing I want to do is talk about Another paper with, I should have uh, mentioned, this is a paper with uh, Larry Samuelson. I want to talk about an, an, another, pa another paper that uh, addresses this issue, also with him. All the, in that story, the one that we've been describing, all of everything so far, I have to do with impatience, uh, the risk that's been there is idiosyncratic to use an economist's word, or independent, to use a mathematician's word. That is, we have risky reproduction. It's all concealed in those X's. Uh, they, they have the means of this risky reproduction. But all, all, of, all of the risk there has to be, for this to, be, for this to work, it has to be that all of the, the risk is independent across individuals. That's, we're appealing to the law of large numbers, and that's what uh, it requires. But, but, uh, lots of, but lots of lots of risks are not uh, like that. And not so obliging as to be independent. An obvious one in the real world now, economic real world, is the stock market, as this, as this cartoon suggests. If the stock market goes up, everyone is buoyed by that experience. If the stock market goes down, everybody is torpedoed uh, uh, by that experience. And if we think about what kind of risks were there in our evolutionary history? There are lots of those that must have been uh, aggregate too. And I don't suppose that was numerically a very important kind of risk, but it's a pretty nice picture. 
uh, is some kind of aggregate risk. We have a tornado plus uh, some lightning. More importantly, uh, the, the, the climate, the weather, would have been a, a, a form of uh, shared risk. I mean, independence means I can't tell anything about you from knowing what my outcome. But uh, it could be the opposite extreme would be aggregate risk, where my outcome tells me yours. It is the same. So, if the, if the if the risk is aggregate, it gives you a uh, a lower growth rate uh, than would equivalent idiosyncratic risk. This is true either for mortality or fertility. So, so think about a stark example of a large population where individuals either have, uh, so one type of individual, they, they flip an uh, uh, independent coin. They each have their uh, very own coin. So there's a judge who's deciding guilt or innocence for a parade of defendants by flipping a coin. Let's suppose he's flipping a, uh, a different coin or the same coin independently for each defendant. Uh, there's also, so that's, so, so either no offspring with probability a half or three offspring with probability a half. And this is uh, independent across individuals. So this is, this is quite dramatic from the point of view of an individual. They're either going to be uh, swamped with kids or have none. But from the point of view of the population, it's not, it's not very exciting. Going to th the, you're going to get the mean, which is three halves. In a large population, it's going to grow with a, at a factor of three halves from one period to the next. Suppose that uh, the, uh, on the other extreme, though, that there are guys who, have, uh, who face this as an aggregate risk. It's the same risk. It's either zero, zero offspring with probably a half or three offspring with probably a half. Uh, but now it's, a, it's as if there's a single giant coin being flipped by this flaming hand. What's going to happen? Who's going to win? This is an evolutionary race. It's pretty, tr it's pretty obvious who's going to win. Type, type 1's uh, growing uh, XT will be 3 halves to the power T times whatever you started with for X0. What about, uh, what about the other guys, uh, the, the, um, the, the type 2's who have 3 or 0 with a single giant coin? Well, they're, gonna, they're okay as long as uh, heads get, keep coming up, but they're going to be a footnote, an evolutionary footnote. It's the moment tails comes up. It's going to be the end of the story for them. So it's the same risk, and it's pretty clear that, that the, uh, the growth consequences are, are radically different. So, so in general, what's true is that uh, you don't need to have the example be that dramatic. It's, gonna, it's a general proposition that it's going to have the growth rate you're going to get is, is a kind of more bigger deleterious effect on the growth rate from aggregate uncertainty than you do from idiosync equivalent idiosyncratic uncertainty concerning either mortality or fertility. There's, there's, there's something that this may help to resolve in economics, which is the so-called equity premium puzzle. And that is that uh, if you look at um, the time path of, if you look at, at the last 100 years of the stock market, and you think about uh, owning a bundle of stocks on the one hand, or owning government bonds on the other, the rate of return on stocks is just, is, Stocks are just going to swamp bonds to the point that it's really puzzling why anyone holds bonds. I mean, it could be extreme risk aversion, but then, the, then if, you if you estimate how risk averse people would have to be to generate that observation about stocks versus bonds, the, the estimate of how risk, risk averse they are doesn't square with other observations about uh, people buying insurance for their houses and cars where much less risk aversion is evidenced. So there's conflict. 
But, but this uh, story proposes a resolution of that because the stock market is an aggregate form of risk and, the, and property losses, uh, by and large, are idiosyncratic. I mean, you could set your house on fire and burn down all of Vancouver, which would qualify as some kind of aggregate risk, but it's not very likely. Or you could, have a, or you could total your car and take out uh, everybody else on the Lionsgate Bridge, but it's not a typical accident. It's largely idiosyncratic. So this would help um, explain this, this puzzle. So furthermore, uh, to go back to the rate of time preference, uh, thinking about aggregate risk, mortality risk, uh, helps um, make the story more plausible in the light of observations of actual rates of time preference. What you can show is that, well, that, that having aggregate uncertainty breaks the tight link that used to exist between the pure rate of time preference on the one hand and the sum of uh, the mortality rate plus the population growth rate on the other. Those things had, had to be the same when all the risk was idiosyncratic. What you can show, though, is that uh, if you start, in, at least in a simple case, you can concern where you, where you introduce aggregate mortality shocks to, to the model that uh, the rate of time preference uh, is not affected. So we, have a, we, have, we could have a population that's growing rapidly, hypothetical population. We introduce some aggregate mortality shocks to make it grow less rapidly. It doesn't affect uh, how impatient people are. They're, it's as if their impatience was conditioned by the rapid growth uh, that, that, that you used to see in the hypothetical setting, which is all this, these equations is, are, in essence, saying. So in the simple, in, a simple, in the simple model, so the key result, uh, the, the rate of time preference can be a lot more than uh, suggested by looking at hunter-gatherers, looking at their mortality rates, which are kind of low, at least according to my uh, co-author, surpri surprisingly low, that is, surprisingly, surprising in the light of what, anth what other anthropologists have said and still say, I should say. But, but he gets rates of around 1% for 10-year-olds uh, and I think around 4% for 60-year-olds. So for people in between those ages, the, the rates of mortality aren't that dramatic. And we know that population growth rates must have been zero, but, but this argument is going to tell us that we can, we can, we can bump up how, how impatient people are. We can make that uh, larger than the one through 4% that I was referring to. So here's an example, just to finish up. This is an example drawn from some anthropological data so we want to we know how, how big a pure rate of time preference can we get? That, that's, the, that's the game we're playing. So, so the, it comes down to, the question, that question comes down to, in the model, uh, how fast would a human, could a few, human population grow if, uh, so looking at like top-end kind of estimates of fertility, but uh, let's abolish mortal, all mortality. Not, not because we're really going to do that in the long run, but because the, the math enables us to do that. So here's the numbers. So uh, each woman produces 0.15 daughters per annum ex in expectation from age 15 to 45. That's pretty, that's pretty active. We're doing a lot of uh, production of kids. It's surprisingly how low that growth rate turns out to be, though. It gives you a population that's growing at about 5.5%. It's low. Why is it low? It's not, the 45 has nothing to do with it. It's the 15 that makes that low. But that means, so but this, in the model, then that's generating a pure, a pure rate of time preference of the same thing, 5.5%. So all we have to, what we need to do then to square this with the data, square this with observation, is to introduce 
enough mortality to bring that growth rate down pretty much to zero. But because that's what we know it must be. So this is some background mortality. Could be 2%, could be 3%. This is uh, an across-the-board uh, winnowing away like delta in the original, in the original model. So we've, whoops, what happened there? So we need to, now we need to do something to stop these people um, from growing so fast. And uh, we put in 2%, we could have put in 3%, but, but we're going to have, we're going to have some catastrophe occur occasionally that, 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 that on a random basis is going to account for the rest. So what, what would, what, a, a kind of catastrophe that would work Uh, suppose it, suppose it, uh, a catastrophe wipes out 90% of the population. That's a big catastrophe. And it, it happens once every 67 years. So you might wonder, well, what does that do to my probability? That, that increases the probability of dying for each individual. Uh, it was originally 2%. And this increases it by one and a half. So we've now got a total, uh, we have um, two plus one and a half, apparently. So well, this will do it. This will give you zero population growth on average. Uh, the rare catastrophe itself can, contributes only an extra one and a half percent. So there's a missing two percent. It's the, it's the aggregate nature of the shark that contributes the, miss, the missing two percent. So there's something, you're getting a, you're getting a bonus from making this, uh, catastrophe aggregate. You're going to get a bigger bonus if you make this if Suppose you want to account for uh, the three. So, so we had five, five and a half percent, and we took away two percent. Suppose you want to account for three and a half percent. Then, as you make the catastrophe, so you, you fix the catastrophe that would do that. If you make that catastrophe more substantial, even than this, and le a lot less likely, uh, what you can show is that the the the, the one and a half percent goes to zero. That is, it, it, it has no effect in the limit on the probability that I'll personally die. Nevertheless, it squares everything. Uh, squares gives, gives you five and a half percent for the period of time preference and enables you to um, square this with the observation that population haven't been growing at one percent even since uh, 1.8 million years ago. Any questions from anybody? Um, <coughs> I wanted to ask about the modeling of the catastrophes towards the end. You have a, you, you, you're sticking in large-scale death rates, but death rates that can't be 100%, I assume. No. You, you're, you're fixing this, the percentages removed. Right. I suppose I'm, I'm supposed to use, use this. Um, I have the feeling that in a modest-sized community, a real sized community, a catastrophe that has a significant risk of removing 90% of the population would be likely to have a significant risk of removing 100% of the population. Well, uh, species and do go extinct. Uh, uh, we, maybe w we know we're here, so it's kind of the anthropomorphic principle, right? That we yeah, must, but I'm, I'm, have, so, so I'm asking you, if, if I'm, but it's, it's really a question about the quality of, if, about the nature of the model. Okay. It, it, Given that we are here, is it realistic to suppose that there were these catastrophes that removed the people at the rate that you need them removed? Well, I, the leading candidates for these catastrophes would be the ice ages, perhaps. And it's, it's in the, uh, if you talk to anthropologists, there aren't any estimates of what populations were before, what happened, at, what happened during, or what they were after. I mean, there are no population estimates, really. Uh, but, but it seems... It seems it seems pretty. It seems pretty inevitable that it would have had a catastrophic effect on all sorts of populations. Uh, I mean, we're 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 
we're running around clothed in skins, if, if anything, and it gets extremely cold. We're living in caves. It gets extremely cold. This is going to be pretty bad. And if it's not bad in terms of freezing to death, it's going to be bad in terms of uh, driving away or killing all of our game. So, so part of your argument was about the, the, the 1.8 million year yep. providing a framework for you to say the population growth rate was zero. Yes. Post ice ages is not is not 1.8 million years ago. No. The, 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 the growth rate since then, I mean, or, or is that not long enough for evolutionary times? Well, populations have you know, not been growing at zero percent since the advent of agriculture. 10,000 years ago has been phenomenal growth, no question. Yeah. Uh, but the advent of agriculture, 10,000 years is not a long time to talk about natural selection. It's possible some things have been uh, selected for in that period. It's not totally a trivial amount of time. But uh, you wouldn't expect it to have massively reshaped our demography uh, in 10,000 years. Uh, so, so we're taking the point of view that the, 10, 000, the last 10,000 years is fantastic that it existed, fantastic that it happened like that, but it's totally atypical in terms of um, our history. And we're focusing on the 1.8 minus the 10,000 years. So, you, I mean, you're right. I, I, it, if uh, things that could kill 90%, it does sound sort of dangerous, yeah. Uh, but we know, the, we know the word, the word Holocaust. I mean, it must have been. Uh, the the, the must have been must have been really bad. Uh, it's maybe maybe it doesn't fit quite numeric. You know, maybe awkward to adjust. We, we sh I didn't think about it that way, but you could try fiddling with the uh, parameters to make it um, consistent with an ice age, m less frequent in particular. I mean, it does. It contributes something. That's what, what, so we're talking about this. Um, we want to square. You know, we have we have data from. The anthropologists are these hunter-gatherers whose pictures I flashed up at the beginning. And they typically grow at around 2% a year. The data there suggests some growth, and which doesn't sound very exciting and didn't excite them very much at first. But then you start thinking about, well, this, may be, this must be a rather atypical position because we couldn't have been, it, it could be that these hunter-gatherer societies in the 20th century are wildly atypical for all, all sorts of reasons. Uh, or, or it could be. A more interesting possibility is that they're not atypical. Really, you, if you picked a hunter-gatherer group a million years ago, you, w you might have seen 2% growth, 2 or 3% growth. And uh, what you wouldn't have seen, most likely, is the occasional catastrophe where, where, they, where they were uh, reduced to a tenth of their original population. So, so, we wanna we wanna, so, so the hunter-gatherer data raises this question. Um, and this provides an answer. And it's suggesting, I mean, you don't have to make this stochastic. If you just said it was a sawtooth, every 10,000 every 10, years there was an Armageddon of some kind. That would do it. It has to be, this, it's important that these Armageddons, catastrophes, holocausts, are equal opportunity, that they uh, wipe out all of the age classes in, in, across the, in an even-handed way. Oh, and all of the uh, uh, competing, uh, if they're competing uh, individuals there, they all get wiped out. And they, they all get reduced by the same fraction. Uh, but as long as that's true, it works out pretty simply. Any other questions? Okay, I guess we're good. Thank you very much.